Good morning. The scripture that I believe the Lord wants us to um, meditate on this morning is out of 1 Corinthians 13, and it's verses 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for allowing me to come and share your message today. Father, I ask that you would help me to say those things that you want said and not say those things that you do not want said. You've been speaking to me all this morning, and I ask that you would help me to make those changes that you asked me to make and that you would give us ears to hear and hearts that understand, and that we can use this message and go out and spread your love to others. In Jesus' name, amen. So all this morning, the Lord's been speaking to me, and I've been changing things, and so you'll have to give me grace here because... I've got pieces of paper, and so anyway. um, But I want us to look at this passage as Paul wrote it to the Corinthian church. If you've read the book of 1 and 2 Corinthians, I believe that you'll see that this church had problems. Paul used these letters to address those problems. Paul opens up 1 Corinthians 13 with these words. And yet, I will show you the most excellent way. What was he talking about? In context, chapters 12 through 14 deal with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There had been abuses in the assembly in Cornish, especially in connection with the gift of tongues. And Paul writes in order to correct those abuses. There were believers in Cornish who liked dramatic spiritual experiences. 
lay love the supernatural gifts like performing miracles and giving words of knowledge and words of wisdom. But instead of using these gifts to magnify God and edify other believers, they were using them to show off. They exalted the, the sign gifts above the others, and they claimed themselves to be super, spiritu uh, super spirituality for those who had these gifts. This led to pride on one hand and to feelings of envy, inferiority, and worthlessness on the other hand. It was therefore necessary for the apostle to correct these erroneous attitudes and to establish controls in the exercise of the gifts, especially the sign gifts and prophecy. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul had reminded them that the church is like a body, the body of Christ. Each organ and limb had an essential part to play in the life of the body. So it is with the church. Each of us has been given spiritual gifts, but we are to use them in love to build up the whole body of Christ, not to show off or chase after spiritual thrills. And so we come to this great chapter of love. This is the most excellent way. Some people tend to divorce chapter 13 from its context. They think of it as a parenthesis designed to relieve the tension over the problems that were shown in chapters 12 and 14. But that's not the case. It's a vital and continuing part of Paul's argument. The abuse of the spiritual gifts had apparently caused strife in the assembly, using their gifts for self-display, self-edification, and self-gratification. They were not acting in love. Chapter 13 defines real love, and chapter 14 shows how real love works. Now, for me, to give a message on love is sort of ironic because I am far from being perfect in this love category. The chapter is what you often hear read at weddings or you see some of the verses written on plaques or posters. But Paul starts it in the context of those spiritual gifts that he had been talking about. Notice how he takes up some of the spiritual gifts in tw of 12, 8 through 10 and shows their emptiness apart from love. Tongues apart from love become mere noise, like the clanging of a cymbal. Prophecy without love makes the prophet nothing. This application can be made to knowledge, spiritual insight given immediately by the spirit, and faith. Paul is not minimizing his gifts. He is simply saying that they will have no good effect on the individual or the church unless there is love in the life of the Christian in the exercise of his or her gifts. We might go so far as to sacrifice our body, but apart from love, this act would amount to nothing. Love is the measure of all things. That's how important today's uh, subject is. Love is more important than all the spiritual gifts exercised in the body of Christ. Love trumps every spiritual gift. Love tops every miracle God may work through you. Love precedes every course of action you might take. Love stands above them all. We can say that love is essential to the life of the church. A quote by Haddon Robinson said, Love is that thing which, if a church has it, it does not really need much else. And if it doesn't have it, whatever else it does have is not, doesn't really matter very much. That's what Paul is trying to say in this message. Our society confuses love and lust. 
unlike lust, God's kind of love is directed outward toward others, not inward toward ourselves. It's utterly impossible to have this kind of love unless God helps us set aside our natural desires so that we can love without expecting anything in return. We can't manufacture this kind of love when we don't feel it. We gain it only through the Holy Spirit. In Romans 5, 5, it says, The love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. If you have the Holy Spirit, then you have access to this unconditional love. Does the world need this kind of love? Yes, it does. God gives it to us, and God wants us to pass it on to others. Jesus urged people to be radical and not just love your friends, but also your enemies. Does that include the staff member who has frustrated you? Does that include the resident who always gets on your nerves? Or the relatives who might have said something uncaring to you? It does. And John records Jesus as saying, I have loved you, so you must love one another. So what is the love that Paul speaks of? Well, the Bible says that God is love in 1 John 4, 8. God is the very definition of love. So the more we get to know God, the more we understand love. Jesus also personified love. In 1 Corinthians 13 is a portrait of which Christ himself has sat. If you want a role model in love, you only need to look at the life of Jesus what becomes clear is that this love is not so much a feeling. Think about this. If love can be commanded, then it's not simply an emotion. You can't command someone to be happy or sad. Love uh, isn't an emotion. Love is an action. The love Paul refers to is agape love. It's unconditional love. It's sacrificial love. The first mention of love in the Bible is in reference to Genesis 22.2. God told Abraham, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. This kind of love is obedient, as Abraham did what God commanded. Sometimes it isn't easy to love in this way. As I was reading this passage, it became very clear to me that all the positive statements in this passage could be applied to God, and all the negative statements could be applied to me. God is patient. In 2 Peter 3 9, it tells us that God is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God is kind. Titus 3 4 and 5 says, But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. God rejoices in the truth. God bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. But me, I'm envious at times and boastful. At times I may be irritated and rude. Even while I was typing this message and I was using my office at work to do so, the accountant at the computer firm emailed me. 
and he asked me a question, and it was all in caps. Well, all caps to me means he's shouting a question at me, and I previously had sent him what he needed for his answer. So I, in turn, turned on my all caps, and I shouted the answer back to him. Then I started once again to type this message on unconditional love. Well, shouting at the accountant on the Internet in my frustration wasn't very loving, and it sure was not agape love of which I was writing to present to you. So I emailed him back. I told him that I was composing a message on love and that using my capital keys was not loving and that I was sorry for doing that. He emailed me back and he said that sometimes his capital keys are turned on and he's too lazy to turn them off. He meant nothing by it. So this just shows me that I've got a long way to go, as probably all of us do, in showing agape love. There are 15 attributes of true love in action in this passage. All of them speak for themselves, but I'm going to touch on several of them. On the positive side, love is patient. Just think how patient Jesus was with the disciples or with the multitudes coming to be healed. Think how patient he was with Peter. And we need to be patient with one another in the church, in our households, and in our communities. We had a family uh, Christmas last Saturday. And I'd asked everyone by email if anyone was bringing any guests, because I was going to have place cards. And I got no response. So I was surprised when my brother and his family showed up with duck. That's their big black Labrador that's very inquisitive. I found out that wherever the family goes, duck goes, even to the farm and home. I believe my patience was being tried somewhat as he traveled around my kitchen table probably 20 times, that I had set up for 10 people, and he and I would run into each other every time he went around. On the other hand, he is a very nice dog, and he just wanted someone to love on him unconditionally. Love is kind. If someone were to pay us 10 cents, for every kind word we've ever spoken about people, and then take back five cents for every unkind word we've ever spoken about people, would we be poor or rich? Kindness costs no money. It's as easy to go around with a smile as it is going around with a frown. Kindness is a big step in the Christian aim to overcome evil with good, as Romans 12, 21. When I think of kindness, I think of the parable of the Good Samaritan. He showed the man kindness that the church leaders did not show. Then we also see what love is not. Love does not criticize the work of others. It doesn't attack worship styles of others. Even if, uh, even if you don't like them. That isn't love or the character of a Christian. Love is not jealous, envious, boastful, arrogant, or rude. Envy, boasting, arrogance, and rudeness are all about competition. Deep down inside, these folks are insecure. They believe there's only so much love and success and good fortune to go around, and if I'm not careful, someone's going to cheat me out of my fair share. But those who love are not in competition with each other. They rejoice 
with those who rejoice in each other's blessings without wishing to have them for themselves. Those who love are not irritable or resentful. They do not get easily upset or offended by others. In fact, they choose to take no offense. Not all uh, irritability stems from sinful or selfish motives, although the irritable treatment of others is surely wrong. Much irritability comes from a love of perfection, a deep desire for programs, plans, meetings, and structures to run perfectly. A desire to run things perfectly can erupt into anger at those who get in the way or ruin an outcome. When we get easily irritated, it helps to remember that perfection exists only in God. We need to love him and our fellow Christians, but not the visions we have for perfection here on earth. Love protects, believes, hopes and endures what others reject. Love never fails. This is love in action. Love that puts the other person's needs first. Love that serves. Love that builds into the lives of others. Love that helps. It's the kind of love that promotes you to to prompts you to sit in a hospital waiting room with a friend or to drop off a note of encouragement to um, face the hard decision about driving or considering a change of living arrangements. It's the love that cares about the other person's interests the love that serves a coffee, uh, a cup of coffee and a piece of dessert. This is love in action. And in verses 9 through 12, Paul gives us hope if we do a poor job of loving others. Right now, we have only partial and incomplete knowledge. We can't do everything perfectly. We are immature like children in how we love others. As we grow closer to Christ, we'll learn to love others better. We lack clarity about the right way to love. Like a cloudy mirror, we do not perfectly reflect Jesus to others. When Paul wrote of knowing fully, even as I'm fully known, he was referring to when we see Jesus Christ face to face. God gives believers spiritual gifts for their lives on earth in order to build up, serve, and strengthen fellow Christians so that they can be better encouraged and equipped to share the love of God with the world. Spiritual gifts are only given to believers. In eternity, we will be made perfect and complete and will be in the very presence of God will no longer need spiritual gifts, so they will come to an end. Then we'll have a full understanding and appreciation of everyone as unique expressions of God's infinite creativity. And we'll use our differences as a reason to praise God. Based on that perspective, Let's treat each other with the same love and unity that we'll one day share. In verse 13, Paul wrote that love endures forever. In morally a corrupt cornice, love had become a mixed-up term with little meaning. Today, people are still confused about love. Love is the greatest of all human qualities, and it's the very essence of God himself. Love involves unselfish service to others. Faith is the foundation and, con and, con and content 
of God's messages. Hope is the attitude and focus. Love is the action. And love is a decision. Love is a tool with which God builds up the body of Christ. And love for the unbeliever is the bridge over which the gospel can cross. As the song states, people will know we are Christians by our love. We need to remember the greatest act of agape love. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The theme of love is selflessness. A couple nights ago, I experienced God's love in a way that I was not expecting. I had come back to the nursing home where I work to get my bag of books. And I drove into my garage, and I am one who likes to take everything in the house in one trip. So I don't have to make another trip and be cold. Why would I want to do that? Why would I want to make two trips? Well, so I had my bag of books in this arm, this hand, and my purse, which is heavy, and another bag in this arm, and I started to walk down my walk to my house. Well, I got overbalanced, and so I started to fall this way, so I tried to compensate and go this way, and I almost thought that I was going to get standing up, and I hit my knees on the sidewalk and my chin. So you might notice that I <laughs> I've got a little bit of a lisp that <laughs> I wasn't expecting when I started talking. Well, so there were a couple of miracles about this. First of all, I got right up off the ground. That was a miracle. And I had a, a mask in my, pro in my pocket, and so I grabbed it because my lip was bleeding profusely. So I grabbed it and put it on my face. So see, it's masks are good for some things. And um, anyway, so I was doing that with the mask, and um, I felt that my teeth had uh, crunched, and I thought, oh, great, I've lost teeth. And so I ran to the nursing home. Where else would I go, right? And so the nurse sort of um, doctored me a little bit and said, you're going to need stitches. Well, it just so happened that the administrator of the home was staying the night that night because we have an outbreak of influenza A right now, and so she was helping the dietary staff with the meals. And so the nurse wanted to go down and get her because she said that I was going to have to go to the emergency room to get a couple stitches, and I was like, oh, please don't do that because I can drive myself. But she would have nothing to say about it, so she went down and got the administrator, and she ended up taking me to the emergency room. To me, that is agape love. She didn't need to do that. She didn't reprimand me for <laughs> not, you know, making two trips. She did what she felt she was to do, and I was very appreciative of it. Um, I got right in, so she didn't have to wait that long. And the husband of my doctor was the one that did the stitches. So um, it was quite a night to be. Uh, and then the next day, I went and had an x-ray of my knees to make sure that I hadn't done anything bad there, and everything was good. So I just wanted to share that that was unconditional, selfless love, and um, I was really very appreciative of it. 
behind all the decisiveness and all the puffed up sense of self-importance, all of the cliquish activity, all of the gossip that the Corinthians suffered from self-centered pride. And Paul said that the antidote is love, love that acts, love that serves, love that builds up the other. Paul introduced the chapter by saying, let me show you a more excellent way, and he has. Now he ends by saying that love is the greatest gift of all, better even than faith, better even than hope itself. I found this, uh, Phil Yancey had written this, and it tells of a story of sitting in a tiny house in uh, South Carolina, watching as Robertson McQuilkin fed homemade soup to his wife, spoonful by spoonful, laughing, talking to her, stroking her cheek, wiping away the spilled food. She could still raise one arm and wave it. Tough, she had made no sounds and showed no signs of recognizing her husband of 40 years. Dr. McQuilkin had resigned as president of a Christian college to care for his wife, Muriel. She had been very successful as a teacher and radio personality until the onset of Alzheimer's disease. For 20 years, he took on that responsibility, canceling many speaking engagements and taking an early retirement from a job he loved so that he could be constantly available to his wife. When asked why he did what he did, he responded, why? I took a vow before God in sickness and in health. Isn't that what love is all about? What does love have to do with it? Absolutely everything. Paul said, we have faith, we have hope, and we have love. And one thing is for sure, love matters the most. When you struggle, ask for God's help. He's more than ready to build your love muscles. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are the very definition of love. Help us to receive your love shown to us most visib visibly by the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, for our sins. Help us to take that most perfect model of love and pass it on to others, those we like being around and those we do not, those we lo who love us and even those who hate us. We need your help to do this, God. So we commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.